So today we're going to discuss 19th century imperialism, uh, and especially how 19th century imperialism actually came about, which was basically for business purposes. Um, in particular, there's a, something called free trade that really fueled 19th century imperialism, and in many ways still fuels imperialism today. So we've already discussed all the geographic advantages that Europe had over much of the rest of the world by about the year 1500, and that put Europe in a really unique position to conduct imperialism. And just as a review, imperialism is the policy of extending control over another region or entity through military, political, and or economic means. Um, so imperialism can come in lots of different shapes and forms. Um, so in this video lecture, we're going to answer a couple of questions. First of all, what was mercantilism and how did it lead to imperialism before the 19th century? So we're going to see um, how Europeans really uh, conducted imperialism up to about the year 1800. Then we're going to look at free trade, which is a kind of a new concept in human history, um, or at least a new concept to European history and how free trade helped fuel 19th century imperialism, or imperialism after about the year 1800. Then we're going to look at the incentives and justifications for 19th century imperialism that came other than free trade, and we're also going to look at how European nations governed imperial holdings. So first of all, let's look at what mercantilism is. Um, we've discussed before how, uh, especially Western Europe, had the, the right geography, the right technology, especially maritime uh, technology, to basically um, explore much of the world around the year 1500 and onwards. Um, so you could actually pause and take a look at um, this map if you'd like, which shows some of the most famous expeditions of Western Europeans from about the year 1450 on, uh, including people like Vasco da Gama, who's the first to sail all the way around the world, um, and Christopher Columbus, who was the first European explorer to actually um, land in North and South America, World Zone 2. Um, after this age of exploration, you had this kind of new age where merchants controlled much of the world. Um, and by control, I mean merchants actually had military power and were able to control much of the world. So uh, with all this discovery of all these new places around the world, you had this discovery of all these new uh, products and goods that you could trade on a market. Um, some of them were luxury goods, things like silk and jade and spices, which pretty much came from Asia. And some were a little bit more practical, like salt, which was needed to preserve food. Um, sugar, which was needed to make food not taste horrible. Uh, tobacco, which was really used to um, as kind of like a work aid. Um, it kept people awake cotton, other things like tea. Um, so there's this really high demand for products that couldn't be found in Europe. And European nations competed for these products. Um, and they usually did so through businesses. They backed these businesses using military force. Um, and so all across the globe, after about the year 1500, you had um, European merchants fighting wars, basically, on the high seas. Um, in addition, all of this extra wealth or surplus that was generated from all this um, buying and selling across the globe, um, and remember European nations had huge technological advantages at this point, so they could essentially like take products from a lot of the world. Um, once Europeans had this extra wealth, that helped accelerate technology and power in Europe. Um, so just to re-emphasize how important merchants were at this time, let's not forget that the United States was basically founded by merchants. Um, here you've got a painting of the founding of Maryland, but everything from the Virginia colony to the Massachusetts Bay colony in some way or shape or form was basically founded by merchants. Um, so mercantilism is a new term. You may have heard it before, but... Um, it's going to help us to understand um, how European nations actually use businesses. So mercantilism refers to the national control and protection 
uh, often through military force, of exports and imports in order to generate surplus wealth. So what it means is that nations basically protect their businesses. They put high taxes on any imports or exports that don't come from their businesses. And they try and protect their business across the globe with military force. So in some ways, it's kind of like nationalism and business put together. Uh, the goal was really to, to create a trade advantage meaning uh, a profitable trading relationship with other nations, and they did this by any means necessary, sometimes through uh, kind of messed up ways. Um, the basic philosophy was that, um, the, that nations should trade with foreign powers, but they should trade to try and get an advantage. Um, very often, national governments set up something called a charter, which was like a business with exclusive trading rights, um, these businesses often kind of function like almost governments in uh, foreign nations uh, or areas of the globe that really were, were still like hunter-gatherers and hadn't even developed national governments yet. Um, and also, part of this philosophy is that military force should be used to secure this trade advantage and to protect your trade from other nations. Um, there were a lot of results from this. One was just a lot of European war. Um, but also it led to the rapid European colonization of much of the world, especially in the Americas and in Southeast Asia. Um, one form of mercantilism is the plantation economy. So um, we know that pretty well from the Americas, but Spain, Portugal, France, Britain all had their own plantation economies uh, where they would actually, in many ways, like uh, destroy much of the local vegetation and create... Uh, new crops like tobacco or sugar uh, in these new areas. Very often they were ruled directly, often through slave labor. But towards about the year 1800, plantation economies started to decline. Partly this was because Europeans and people across the globe were pretty um, disgusted by slavery. You also had independence movements that developed across the, the globe in these slave colonies. And you... Um, also had just the fact that it was really, really expensive to directly rule and enforce slavery. Um, so in a lot of ways, plantation colonies started to decline by about the year 1800. You also had trading colonies. Um, these were basically like coastal cities or outposts where Europeans tried to trade their manufactured goods, um, everything from guns to like clothing, for uh, local goods that they didn't have access to. This was in some ways a, a much more humanitarian way of trading for Europeans. Um, it was also cheap and it required little infrastructure or bureaucracy. Um, so just as an example, uh, you have, for instance, like Bombay, India, or Mumbai, India, Cape Town, Jakarta, New York City, Hong Kong, all these places began as European trading colonies. A really good example of a mercantile business um, was the Hudson Bay Company. This operated in Canada. Um, it was a British charter starting in about the year 1670. And it, its main purpose was to try and find fur, or animal fur, across Canada. So um, this business basically relied on people exploring these huge forests in Canada, some of the, the densest forests in the world. Um, searching for animals, hunting the animals, uh, processing the animals, and then selling them back to Europeans and Americans in order to make things like winter clothing or hats or shoes. Um, you got to remember that most of Europe and the United States got really, really cold in the winter. Um, so they needed these kinds of furs to, mm -hmm. to keep them warm. Um, but a big drawback of mercantilism was... Things like uh, the Seven Years' War, where uh, this was a really global war where you had countries like France and Portugal fighting countries like, or excuse me, countries like Britain and Portugal fighting countries like France and Spain all across the world um, on multiple continents. For instance, the French and Indian War was really just the American theater of the Seven Years' War. And in many ways, this actually leads to countries going bankrupt, other countries losing lots of military power, losing colonies. So, in many ways, the mercantile system, Europeans quickly found out, could lead to war. So, um, 
we're going to look at the rise of a new concept, free trade, and how this fueled imperialism. So free trade in many ways comes from uh, Enlightenment ideas. People like John Locke and John Jacques Rousseau were big proponents of liberty, and free trade really comes from this idea of liberty. Um, in many ways, free trade is the most natural way to trade, and so probably the first human economies used free trade. But as uh, civilization started to develop like powerful governments, governments kind of took control of merchants, just like in mercantilism. So free trade is in many ways a move back towards businesses that have more independent power. Um, so again, Enlightenment ideas really influenced this. And um, it's in many ways just the idea that that companies are going to um, have liberty and independence in where and how they trade. So the biggest proponent of free trade is a guy named Adam Smith. Um, he was an Enlightenment economist. Uh, he was actually Scottish. Uh, so he argued that businesses best operated when they were left alone by governments. And so free trade, which is really international trade with literal no tariffs or taxes on imports and exports, was uh, better than mercantile trade. So in other words, it was best if governments didn't have high taxes and didn't necessarily try and make sure that only they made money. Instead, Smith argued that businesses would do better if they just promoted independent businesses. So this seems a little complicated, like why would this benefit a state? But Smith basically believed that if uh, everybody operated out of their own interests, so if everybody was just kind of looking out for themselves and making sure they got what they needed, then supply and demand would provide society with everything it needed. So for his idea was, you know, if there was a demand for something, it would be created because somebody would find a way to make it, sell it, and make money from it. So he argued for something called laissez-faire capitalism. And this is a capitalist economy with, with no taxes or restrictions on business whatsoever. So this is really different than mercantile capitalism or mercantilism. Um, again, Smith basically thought that um, supply and demand would function as something like an invisible hand. So this, like, imagine a hand kind of sweeping through society and, and creating innovations where they were needed, um, creating things that people needed, and fixing problems that were hurting society. Um, so you, you have a quote here, by pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of the society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. So in a lot of ways, 19th century European nations started to think that they could benefit from free trade. If they encouraged free trade, the economy would be stronger, people would make more money, there would be more, more and better products around. And uh, in a lot of ways, they were right. The, very often the most liberal economies are the strongest ones, and they're the ones that have um, the best products. Also, um, the people, European publics, uh, really liked this idea of liberty in business, and uh, many of them thought that laissez-faire capitalism was also the best way to go. Um, Europe also developed a few innovations that really helped free trade. One was banks. So these were independent institutions that gave money to new businesses. Um, and so there's a lot more money floating around Europe in order to start new businesses. Joint stock companies, this was another way to start a new business. This is where people got together, put up a little bit of money towards a business. Um, so the business collected lots of money from lots of different people. And then the idea was that investors would get a share of the profits once the company started to make money. And this made really expensive new businesses possible, things like oceanic trade and industrial factories. And lastly, you had something called the Limited Liability Corporation, or the LLC. And this was basically the idea that businesses were separate entities from people. So a business could, for instance, get into trouble, but the people wouldn't be prosecuted for the business. So... In some ways, what this did is it allowed for riskier ideas. So if the business failed and somebody got hurt, the people were protected and wouldn't have to go to jail. So it actually encouraged a lot more um, people to conduct businesses. And today, there are millions of LLCs in the just in the United States.
and it is in, in a lot of ways it's a way to kind of protect citizens from businesses but in some ways it also creates these kind of monster corporations that don't seem to have any restrictions on them either way this also further allowed free trade in Europe and maybe the biggest thing to allow free trade was the Industrial Revolution so this was the shift from human manufacturing to machine-powered manufacturing and it used fossil fuels as the energy to fuel this manufacturing so things like coal, oil, etc. Um, this really allowed mass production but what this also meant was suddenly you had way more products on the market and so businesses needed to find new markets to sell these products and then they also needed raw materials to keep making these products so um, what this leads to is in addition to creating a need for lots of new businesses it also created a need to go find where you could get these raw materials and uh, this is eventually going to lead us towards imperialism as you're probably guessing but um, as part of the industrial revolution there are lots of new technologies like railroad steamships telegraph lines and then other things like machine guns and what these actually allowed is for private businesses if they could get a hold of these things to basically operate as almost like powerful independent nations um, so as we'd gone over before um, I'll let you pause and take a look at this but essentially um, there were incentives for European businesses to go find new raw materials also to create products that would um, uh, uh, basically um, supply the middle class that was emerging and also manufacture products that would supply the working class so all levels of society really bought and sold things that were produced by industrial free trade businesses so what this meant is actually it didn't reduce mercantilism it actually led to this huge wave of new imperialism so suddenly with free trade and the industrial revolution you had this massive new scramble for colonies by European nations and so we're gonna look at how that actually came about um, we call this phase new imperialism so before we've looked at 19th century imperialism new imperialism is in many ways like a, it's a synonym for this um, so what Europeans realized is or European nations realized is um, most countries didn't want foreign powers coming in and setting up businesses especially setting up businesses that would just take raw materials from them um, so most places didn't want European businesses coming in and so Europeans actually had to um, go in and establish some sort of rule so that their free trade companies could actually do business in other countries um, and there are a few ways that they actually did this one was uh, direct rule and so this was using colonies in which uh, a European power like uh, say France would go to another country or another region of the globe they would militarily conquer it and they would set up their own governors and bureaucracy in order to run it and that was called direct rule and that was a colony you also had indirect rule which was in some ways also a colony but this was controlled by um, say a country like Britain who would use local governors and bureaucracy to run the country and they would usually like bribe them or threaten them with force to basically get them to do what they wanted um, in a lot of ways native people were able to retain some self rule so things like uh, you know laws about cultural practices and laws about um, some taxes was kind of, were kind of left up to local people you also had um, less uh, less obvious ways of imperialism one was spheres of influence where a group of nations would get together and kind of decide on which areas of the globe they would have control over in terms of business um, European businesses were so much more powerful than other regions businesses that if a European business went into a region they essentially beat out all the competition um, and then today you still have things like economic imperialism where a less developed country is infiltrated by a, a private more advanced company and that company basically beats out all the competition so for example France and Vietnam had direct rule 
So uh, they began in an area in uh, by the coast near Trading Colony in um, southeast Vietnam, and eventually they slowly continued to conquer much of Vietnam and also present-day Cambodia and Laos, and they created a new directly ruled colony called Indochina. The British, meanwhile, in a country like India, which was just massive, um, used indirect rule. So in some ways, in some places, they actually would conquer the region and they ruled it directly. In other ways, they kind of negotiated with um, local kingdoms like uh, the Nawab in uh, various parts of um, central India or in Rajasthan. And um, in other places, they just kind of contracted with businesses. So because the country was so big, they, they had different ways of ruling it. Um, and in a place like China, which was so big and so powerful that Europe was never really able to conquer it, European nations instead just kind of broke it up into small little pieces, and their businesses had exclusive rights over those areas. Um, so again, because China was so big, it was pretty much impossible to, to conquer, and so this was the only way to conduct imperialism there. Um, Europeans had a lot of justifications for why they began to do this. One was this idea of humanitarianism, or the civilizing mission. So Europeans said that what they were really doing was promoting democracy and free trade and Christian religion and European education and spreading technology. And in a lot of ways, it's, it's hard to argue with this. Today, most of the world uses the technology that Europeans brought. So Europeans said that in some ways they were they were doing this to help the rest of the world but this could easily become something uh, a lot more sinister so the idea of the civilizing mission in some ways could become racist and it was this idea that Europeans were the only ones who knew how to do things and so they had to teach the rest of the world how to do things um, you also had a much more overtly racist justification called social Darwinism um, here you have local African lords that are having to um, basically bow to British lords and um, bow and, uh, and kiss their boots. And so the basic idea that some Europeans had was that Europe was a much more advanced race of people and that the rest of the, the world, it was basically under their dominion. So the rest of the world needed to be governed by them. Um, and lastly, you had this idea of nationalist competition. So Europeans, nations were competing with one another. And so in many ways, um, imperialism became like a race to get the most colonies in order to get the best businesses. Um, so in this last picture, you have various nations like Russia as a bear, Britain as a lion, um, and they are basically slaughtering a dragon that portrays China, and so the idea is that they're competing to, um, to get the most power for themselves. So we've discussed this before, but there was definitely some resistance to imperialism. Um, a good example would be the Zulu War in Southern Africa in the 1830s, but even though there was usually very fierce resistance across the world, um, this resistance was really no match for European military and communication technology. Other kinds of resistance, um, like the Taiping Rebellion in China, which by some counts is the most violent rebellion in the history of mankind, um, this was in some ways misguided because it became a local glass, grassroots rebellion, largely against not only Euro foreign European powers, but also the ruling Chinese power. And so it actually weakened the Chinese government to such a degree that they couldn't actually fight off European powers. So because of the complicated ways that Europeans tried to conduct imperialism, sometimes resistance was really ineffective. But for the most part, collaboration was the best way that Europeans were able to do anything. Um, by bribing local rulers or offering various technologies or in some ways offering protection from other European powers, Europeans were able to establish rule ac across the globe, largely with the help of local rulers. So just some basic conclusions here. Europeans had some really distinct advantages over the rest of the world by about the year 1500, and they would exploit these advantages. 
European nations tried to secure trade advantages um, or basically make a profit first through mercantilism and then through free trade in order to benefit their own nations. So even though they advocated for free trade, in many ways they were doing this so that they could have the best, most robust economies that would actually beat up other countries. You also had uh, European nations using a variety of justifications for their imperialism. And finally, you had Europeans governing through a variety of methods. Now, I know this was a long video lecture, but this is meant to be pretty exhaustive and to give you a lot of information that you can use um, to process over the next week or so. So I hope you enjoyed, and please ask me questions in class as you have them.